This video is brought to you by SetApp, a super simple way to discover and install the best apps and utilities from premium independent Mac developers. I'm so excited for this video. I'm gonna be comparing my brand new 2018 MacBook Pro to my old slower laptop. This is a huge upgrade for me. And here it is. I'll tell you all about the specs in a second. And here's the old one. Okay, it's not booting at all for the love of Okay, just cut to the B-roll. though I had this all planned out. The idea of this video is what's it like for a normal computer user to upgrade to the 2018 MacBook Pro. This is my 2013 MacBook Pro that I've been using a lot for years. It's worked great every day until I tried to move it over with Migration Assistant. So be careful, make sure you back up. Most of the comparisons I've been seeing are to the 2017 model and I do not upgrade every year. This is a huge upgrade for me. Of course, before I configured my machine, I did tons of research, which can be the funnest part of ordering a new computer. So I talked to a few people who know way more about Apple than I do or anyone else does. Rene Ritchie is at iMore and he's a regular guest on Mac Break Weekly. So I had a few questions for him. Hey Renee, so I'm excited about my new MacBook Pro, but I'm also worried about making the right choice. So first of all, what are the biggest changes in the processors? So with the 2018 MacBook Pro, they've gone to Intel's Coffee Lake, their eighth generation cores. And the big deal here is in the 13-inch MacBook, they've gone from two to four cores. And in the 15-inch MacBook, they've gone from four to six cores. Even after the throttle gate controversy is blown over and we're not worried about it anymore, I've still seen that some of the benchmarks are showing similar performance across the different processor options. When do I know when it's worth upgrading? Like what's the biggest difference with the i9? With the i9, you just get a bigger burst. So it has higher baseline and higher turbo frequencies, but because it's doing more performance, it's gonna get throttled down faster. So what you have to balance out is if you're doing a lot of sustained work, like for example, if you're rendering video where those cores are gonna be hot for a long time, then you're probably not gonna notice much of a difference. But if you're doing things that work on a short burst, like you're launching and closing and doing a lot of sequential tasks, then the i9 might give you that faster initial burst. I like to think of i9 as a vanity metric though. It's sort of like I bought the top of the line Mac lulls. But for most people, they won't see a big enough difference, I think, to warrant the price jack. So, but for video editing, do you feel like the i7 is a pretty safe choice? Yeah, I think at least personally for video editing, my biggest bottlenecks are, are seldom processor. I mean, these days, a lot of them are fast. Uh, the biggest performance boost I got was getting the bigger hard drive. I'd actually talked myself into getting the fastest i9 processor, but in the end, I canceled my order and reordered it with an i7 so that I could upgrade the internal SSD. So then my other big concern was the keyboard. The 2016 models were notorious for getting little specks of dust under the keys and then the whole keyboard needing to be replaced. I talked to Casey Liss from Accidental Tech Podcast, which is the podcast you should be listening to if you buy any Apple products. What his thoughts on the new keyboard are. I had a lot of anxiety going from like the old reliable uh, MacBook Pro that has never broken, the keyboards work forever, how likely is it that they fixed it on these new ones? You know, it's hard to say so soon. I have a year old MacBook Adorable, which is the 12 inch MacBook. And certainly it is the first Mac or Apple device that I've owned where I've needed to take compressed air to it in order to fix it. I've never had to do that before, but it's only happened a couple of times in the last year and it's always fixed everything pretty much straight away. With the new ones, I looked at the iFixit teardown, which I'm sure you've seen as well, and it certainly seems like there's improvements. Apparently, Apple's put a membrane or a series of membranes around each of the keycaps such that it keeps all of the detritus and dust and sand and whatever crumbs from getting under the keycaps, which is super important. Now, it's not flawless, but it's a lot, lot better. So all indications at first anyway seem to be that it's going to be deeply improved, but only time will really tell if it's 100% fixed. So let me know after a few months and you tell me. And for the first time ever, my old Mac wouldn't start up. And I really want to use Migration Assistant because of like little system preferences I have hidden. Or even if I don't, I need to get my data off of there. So I've got an appointment at the Apple store. Hopefully a genius can help me. My old computer is pretty slow, but it never had any serious issues like this before. I'm positive it was caused by Migration Assistant. So there's good news and bad news. Uh, the drive does still work. I can access it in target disk mode. 
but I still can't boot from it. Uh, migration assistance still won't work. So I'm gonna have to start from scratch. And by the way, excuse the mess, our studio is being <laughs> renovated. But that's okay. Fortunately, I have a few other machines I can test here. So this is my wife's 2015 15-inch MacBook Pro, and this is my 2013 27-inch iMac. My first test is gonna be importing photos into Lightroom. This is like probably my worst bottleneck right now. It just totally chokes all the time. It takes forever to copy the files over and then render previews. So I'm gonna import 200 raw photos that were shot on the 5D Mark IV and I'm gonna generate standard previews. Usually I'd be importing more than that, like a card holds two to 3,000, but it'll give us an idea where the bottleneck is. Um, I'm actually expecting Lightroom to be the bottleneck and there not to be a huge difference here, but we'll see. Wow, so I'm not even gonna bother testing that on the iMac. That came out way closer than I expected. The 2015 MacBook actually rendered it two seconds faster. Um, I would put that down to that they're doing the same thing. The bottleneck probably lies either in the copying it off of the card or in Lightroom's optimization. I hoped it would make a difference, but it doesn't. All right now to test exporting out of Lightroom. This isn't a huge bottleneck, but I just wanna know. Same 200 files, they both have the same presets on them. Actually, wait, this, I'm gonna plug in this iMac. Right now, I kind of use this iMac as my like power workstation when I need to get serious work done, but I'm hoping that in the future, this will be fast enough to kind of replace this and I'll just be able to use an external monitor. Damn, the iMac took a few more seconds longer to import. Okay, anyway, let's export out of everything here. All right, these will be full resolution JPEGs with minimal compression, tiny bit of sharpening. All right, now I'm seeing the difference I wanted to see. The 2015 MacBook Pro came in at 17 minutes and 16 seconds. iMac, 10 minutes. 14 seconds, that's a huge difference. But that's what I'm used to. My laptops are always slower than my desktops. The new MacBook Pro came in at nine minutes, 45 seconds. So that's one step closer to letting this be my full-time machine, which it's gonna have to be either way. Let's move along to Final Cut Pro, another application I use a lot. I'm gonna start by using the Bruce X test. This is an XML file you can download so you can compare basically any computer. You can go download it too and compare it all my computers. All right, let's start some exports. All right, now things are really getting interesting. The 2015 MacBook Pro took two minutes and 31 seconds. The 2013 iMac, one minute, 35 seconds. And the all new 2018 MacBook Pro just took 36 seconds. That's three times faster than this. That's a minute faster than the iMac. I've, I've gotta say, I'm, I'm pretty happy about that. Remember when I said that I wanted to use Migration Assistant for this new computer? Well, it's because I just don't have a lot of time to waste setting up all my new applications and finding my system preferences, and there's a million things to configure about a new computer. But thankfully, getting my new computer ready is a whole lot easier, thanks to SetApp. It's a subscription service that gives you access to some of the best independent Mac apps available. This is a sponsor that I'm really excited to be working with because a lot of the applications they offer I'd already been using for years and are really indispensable to me. Some of my favorites are Bartender, that's one of the first things I install on any computer, Chronosync, which I use for all my backup, iStat, Clean My Mac, Screens, and a whole bunch more. So the next time you're looking for a specific application that does just what you need, it's probably already in your catalog of 120 apps made available by SetApp. So go to stpp.co slash Stallman to find out how setup can make your Mac experience better. So it's been a few more days. I've had some time to really live with this laptop, get a little more used to it. Uh, I did a bit more testing. Probably my biggest discovery is that the huge bottleneck in Lightroom was because my external drives were too full. So there's 500 gigs left on a five terabyte drive. And that took what should have been a three and a half minute download to be about 20 minutes. I know that it doesn't apply to this new computer, but something you should be aware of. And also that slowdown doesn't happen in the finder when you're copying files. It's just a Lightroom issue. I've also got to talk about a few details about this design. I know it's been around since 2016, but there are some things that I'm encountering for the first time because I just got this computer. USB-C has been frustrating and I don't really blame Apple here. I know that they thought if they put them in all their laptops and make it the only option, the whole industry will catch up. That's what happened when they put USB on the iMac. Unfortunately, the industry is going slowly. There are issues in figuring out which cable is USB-C versus Thunderbolt and whether they can pass power. And so even with the adapter I got, I found it wasn't passing power through to my iPhone when I was trying to charge it. So. I gotta figure out what that's about. Just things that I don't wanna think about, like I used to be able to just plug and play. And missing the SD card reader slot has been awful. I really, it's it's frustrated me a lot. They really have to bring it back. I know they're not gonna go back to USB-A. I can live with that. Please bring back an, an SD card reader. And last negative I'll mention is the layout of the arrow keys. They're like just a rectangle now, whereas they used to be a T-shape, and so it's much easier to navigate with your fingers without looking at them. But now onto the positive, there are a lot of things to love about this. It has been, 
fast. I mean, a lot of the speed differences are little things that are hard to benchmark because it's just moving between applications. Transferring files internally, like the, the drive is so fast that if you're copying things or duplicating files, it's, it's really quick. Part of that's also APFS. The new file system, which does clever, interesting things in uh, copying files. The only times I've had Final Cut slow down so far is when I apply blur effects, which I don't do often, but everything else I could chew through quickly, even 4K, my exports are, they feel instant really, like I feel like I'm not even waiting anymore. Oh, and also the speakers sound amazing, like weirdly good coming out of a small laptop, especially if you're used to an old small 13 like I am. There's actually bass and stereo separation. And then the keyboard, haven't had any problems with it yet. I have been enjoying using it. I know other people have complained about the shallow travel of the keys, but it's been working well for me. This is probably a personal taste thing. And the fingerprint reader has been great. And overall, I've been loving this upgrade. This is the time to do it. Like when this generation first came out, I think there was enough problems that it was worth waiting, but I've been really happy that 2018 was the year that I did it. I'll be talking more about the MacBook Pro in the future, as well as some of my favorite applications and utilities that I use on it. So come find me on Twitter where I'll be posting more about it. And thanks again for watching.